Welcome back, and this is the last lecture in this small little section on mathematical programming. Today we're going to look at the GCD, the greatest common divisor, and how it can be solved using the Euclidean algorithm. Sometimes when I teach this uh, lesson, I like to call it uh, simple problems, not so simple solutions. Let's look forward to uh, learning this new topic today. Okay, a little bit of background first. The GCD, did I do that in elementary school? Actually, I think you did, and you did it all in your head for the most part. Let me just start doodling here just to give you a rough idea of what the GCD or the greatest common divisor is. If you were doing a fraction problem in elementary school and you ended up with something like this, 2 over 4, your teacher might say, try to reduce it into its lowest term. So you'd say to yourself, okay, what's the biggest number that goes into this one and this one? And obviously it's 2, and then you divide the 2 by 2 and the 4 by 2 and you get a half. So in your mind, you were just basically sort of winging it, saying, well, let me try this, let me try this, let me try this. Well, in computer science, we need a, a more structured approach. We need a, an algorithm. We love algorithms. We love following sets of procedures that will work for any possibility. And that's what I'm going to teach you today. What we're going to do today is learn uh, the Euclidean algorithm. And it's from one of the most famous mathematicians of all time, Euclid. And what he did is set up a series of steps that work for any set of integers. So this is only how you reduce a whole number over a whole number. And it works perfectly all the time. So what we have in front of you is uh, the documentation for today's resources. And again, if you're not sure what the GCD is, let's try a couple of quick examples again. If I had 8 and 14, what's the biggest number that goes into both? Well, 2. Nothing else goes into both. Uh, 16 and 24, 8. Like 2 goes into both of them also, and so does actually 4. But 8 is the greatest common divider. And then 6 and negative 9, 3 is the greatest common divisor. Negative 3 goes in there too, but it's not the greatest. We want the biggest number, right? So the GCD of two integers, uh, m and n, is a, a positive integer, d, satisfying the following two conditions. d divides m and d divides n. And there's no positive integer greater than d with the previous property. Okay, now the Euclidean algorithm. Okay, so you could guess it. You could uh, sort of bull your way through it, uh, sort of what we call brute force, and try all kinds of combinations until you got one that worked. But uh, there's a more elegant way, and I'm going to show you it right now. So before I explain the one that I have here on the document for today's lesson, let's do a simple example. Let's say we had 4 and 14. Here's what the Euclidean algorithm wants us to do. It wants us to take the bigger number first, which is obviously 14, and divide it by the smaller. And uh, we're going to do that stuff where you have like quotient and remainder. So how many times does 4 go into 14? Well, it goes in 3 times, right? So you get 12, and there's 2 left over. So then Euclid said, now take this bottom divisor and put it to the top and move this remainder to the bottom here and do the math again. Well, that goes in twice. Remainder zero. This is your signal. Once you've got a remainder of zero, sometimes it takes seven steps. Sometimes, like this one, it only took two steps. What you do is the actual GCD is the previous remainder, the one just before the zero remainder. So, and that's correct. The GCD of 4 and 14 is 2. That's the biggest number that goes into both. Let's take a look at a more complicated example just to make sure we understand the process. This one you probably couldn't do in your head or it would take you a long time. What if I wanted you to find the greatest common divisor between those two numbers? 204 and 156. This is where the power of Euclid's algorithm really comes into play and this is where now we can really start to program it with this knowledge. So we take 204 divided by 156, that goes in once with 48 left over. Now 156 becomes the numerator, so to speak, and the 48 goes to the bottom. That goes in three times with 12 left over. We're just about done. Now we take the 48, move it to the top, take the 12, move it to the bottom. That goes in four times zero remainder, bingo. So the last non-zero remainder is our G. C, D. Okay, now we got to program it. And uh, the number of steps we're going to have to 
think through, okay? Now here I've got developing the VB code or C sharp code or whatever code, it doesn't matter. So uh, when do we know when we found the GCD? When R is zero. So we're gonna work out this remainder constantly, 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 and if it equals zero, we're gonna stop the program basically, and then we're done. Now how do you find remainders? Well, here's a pretty complicated expression, uh, which would work, okay? You would cast the integer, but uh, I want to show you the C sharp way, which hopefully you remember from previous lessons. So let's say J is one of the numbers, like the top number, and I is the bottom number. To find the remainder, remember that little percent sign? That's going to find our remainder for us, okay? So that's going to be part of the process when we do the actual program. Let's continue. Now, uh, when R is zero, uh, what variable does the GCD equal? Well, the GCD is going to equal I. And you're going, uh-oh, what do you mean I? Well, remember, it was the last non-zero remainder. So when you're dividing J by I, where did this guy come from? It came from the question before when you were doing the division. Remember, you take the last remainder and you put it to the bottom. So when you get a zero remainder here, you look up here for the answer. And hey, it's the letter I. So when you're done with a remainder of zero, the GCD equals I. Now, what if it's not equal to zero? Then what do you do? Well, then you gotta start switching stuff, right? So here are the transformations we do. We make the I equal to J, okay? So now if this didn't work, this moves to the top. So that's what this is saying. And remember this remainder? This remainder moves to the bottom, okay? So that's the entire process from beginning to end and that's what we call kind of like an algorithm before we actually program it. Let's take a look at the code. Now the code is in the resources for today's lesson and it's called GCD. Love this program, really good, nice and clean. Um, give it a run first just to make sure it works. It's GCD of two numbers. Let's go with 56 and 24. What's the GCD of those two numbers? 8. That's the biggest number that goes into both. Nice. Let's take a look at how we did it. So we're going to use a function, okay? We love functions that makes things more efficient, more structured when you solve them, okay? So here is where we're asking the person, and I'll widen this just a little bit so you can see it better. We're asking the person for two numbers, okay? And then we print out the answer. Now, how did that happen so fast? Well, inside of this uh, little message box, this is where I'm calling a method called the GCD and I'm passing two variables, an A and a B. A is the first number I typed in and B is the second. Now where is this GCD method? Well it's up here I guess. Okay, so it's always going to be the same size no matter how big or small the numbers are. So first of all, uh, you'll I'll show you where this comes into play in a second. There is the remainder that we're going to use. Now this is kind of a tricky line. And later on when we do uh, sorting, you'll see where this comes into play more. Now, what if the two numbers you fed in like were 12 and 4? That's nice, okay? So M is bigger than N and everything's perfect, no problem. But what if a person on purpose or unintentionally gave you 4 and 12? E. Well, the GCD algorithm doesn't work for that kind of combination. The first numbers ought to be bigger than the second. Or at least the same size. So what do you got to do? Well, we got to switch them. I got to make this one uh, go up here and this one go down here. That's where this comes in. This is called a swapping routine. Now I do have a few minutes, so it uh, bear with me. I'll, I'll show you the mechanics of what's happening here. Now remember, the first number is in M and the second number is in N. So I've made a mistake and I've decided that I was going to give you four first and uh, twelve second. That's bad. So what you might say is, well, you know what? Make this one go over here and make this one go over here. Now watch what happens when I do that. If I write down M equals N, okay? So that means take this number, which is a 12, and put it over here. It wipes out the four, and yes, now M is a 12 perfectly. And now you would say, okay, now you do the, the next step would be to do the reverse. Okay, take M and move it. Oh, uh oh and move it over. Uh, do you see what happened? I destroyed this poor number four. I never got a chance to move over there. They're both 12. So this isn't going to work. So this is where this technique comes in. 
what we do is we have three variables. Okay, so we have this temp, which is going to come into play in a second. We have an M and an N. So again, that's a 4 and that's a 12. Okay, so what this line here says is, get this guy over here really quickly because he's going to be destroyed in a few seconds. He's going to be killed. So move him over there. Okay, so that's what that line does. Okay, now M equals N, which means move this guy over here. Okay, no problem. That becomes a 12. And this guy's a 4, remember? And so this line says, now move this guy over here. And we scratched it out, and that becomes a 4. And now the world is perfect. Okay? And that we call the swapping routine. I probably spent more time than I was supposed to on that little part. But it's really important. It's an important lesson to learn. Okay? And you're going to see it more when we do sorting, when you're rearranging things. Okay. Let's get into the guts of the GCD. The GCD itself is not that hard. Basically, remember, all you do in the GCD is work out the remainder. And if the remainder equals zero, you break and you return N. Now remember, we were using J and I. In this question, we're using M and N. And remember in my algorithm, we were going to return the letter I. Well, it's going to be the N in this case. Okay, now if we don't return the letter N because we haven't got a zero remainder yet, then we just switch. The bottom goes to the top and the remainder goes to the bottom. And that is the GCD algorithm. It's that simple. Okay, now with that knowledge and power, you can do all kinds of cool things. How about finding the GCD of three numbers? It can be done, all right? To find the GCD of three numbers, um, we don't have a, a method for three, but what you do is, and this is really neat, it's just almost like you have a, a, a method inside a method. Watch what we do. We have three numbers. So what I do is I have the GCD of the first number, comma, isn't this cool? The GCD of B and C together. So this answer is going to come back with a GCD, okay? And then whatever that answer is combined with the A will go back to the GCD function. That is cool. That's almost called a, an embedded function, okay? A function inside of function. Sometimes in uh, math, again, there's this thing called F on G where you have F and then inside of that you have a G function. So we're almost using that kind of knowledge. More cool stuff, even more cool stuff. Watch this. I don't know if you've ever heard of an LCD, okay, which is the, uh, or an LCM, sorry, the lowest common multiple of two numbers. So watch this. What if I had um, 4 and 14? So the lowest common multiple of 4 and 14. So what is the smallest number that both these things go into, like, uh, 4 goes into 12, and 4 goes into 16, but 14 doesn't go into 16. So it ends up that 28. So 4 goes into 28, and 14 goes into 28. That's the lowest common uh, okay, uh, multiple. And let me show you the program. I, I created another function. Here is the lowest common uh, multiple. And basically, you multiply the two numbers together. So it's kind of cool. You take the 4, and you times it by the 14 and you divide it over the GCD of these two numbers. What's the biggest number that goes into both of these? 2 I guess. Then I'm going to cancel those out. 2 times 14 is 28. Yeah it works. This is how you find the lowest common multiple. So see how you can leverage the power of this GCD and then use it to find other solutions to problems. Isn't that cool? Okay this is brand new stuff, and I really want you to try it and understand how it works. So I'm going to pause the recording in a few minutes or in a few seconds, and uh, I'm going to give you some time to work on it, and then I want you to come back after and see how the solution is. Now, don't cheat, because the solution actually is in the resources for today, but I want you to try this question right here. And there's two of them. You can try both of them if you want, but I really want you to try this one. I want you to write a program that will input any two fractions, and then work out what they work out to, and then reduce it into lowest terms. So you're going to have to have like four inputs. You can use a text box if you want, or have four input boxes. It's totally up to you. And uh, after they calculate the common denominator, because you need a common denominator, you're going to reduce it into lowest terms. Give it a try, and we'll take it up uh, whenever you feel like it. So stop the tape now and uh, give it a try. Okay, it's doodling time. i got to doodle some stuff on the board here just to get through the mechanics. Now, hopefully you realize how to add two fractions mathematically. Forget about the computer program for a second, okay? 
So when you have two fractions, you're always trying to add them by using a common denominator. So you say to yourself, what two things do both of these go into? Well, this one's easy. They both go into 8. So 8 would be the common denominator. But what if you got an ugly one like this? Okay, so what two do these go into? Well, you don't really know. So hopefully you learned this in school. The easiest way to find the common denominator is just times these two guys together. So the common denominator ends up being 35. So don't even think about it. So what you do is you just take these two numbers and times them together. Then this one needs a 2 times 7, which is 14. And this one needs a 5 times 1, which is 5. Okay, so now you've decided this is how you find common denominators. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm in good shape. But now it has to work for anything. So now what you do is you have to work with letters because you are going to accept any numbers, integer numbers. And now you have to say to yourself, okay, now, what's the common denominator going to be? Well, I just told you in the last example, if you don't know what these two things go into, just times them together. So there's our first thing. The common denominator is always going to be these two things times together. You don't know what they are. Don't worry about it. The computer will do the dirty work, but just realize that that's the common denominator. Now, what do you put up here and what do you put up here? Well, this letter A you have to times by the D. And then you add the letter C and you times it by the B. So that's how you take something that's very concrete and numeric and you abstract it so that it's working in general terms. So this is a good question to sort of force yourself to think, how do I make it work for anything? And that's really the most important part of computer programming. If you're just going to work out a simple problem, just use your calculator or write it down on a piece of paper. But when you extend it so it works for anything, there's the power of computer programming. Okay, enough of the background. Let's get into the actual program. So this program is called Fractions. It's on your hard drive, and uh, I'll give it a quick run for a second. It actually has both solutions, but we're only going to uh, add up the, these kind. Okay, so uh, 3 over 6 and 2 over 9. Okay, and it ends up being 13 over 18, and it's not reduced any lower than that. Okay, let's take a look at the code to see how we did it. And again, you're going to see that I did not reinvent the GCD. The GCD is the GCD is the GCD. It'll work all the time for any situation. And just to remind you how it worked, we had a problem if we had the first number smaller than the first, so this would swap them. And then here is the loop. And the loop goes from ever and ever and ever until the remainder equals zero. When it's zero, we get out of the loop and we return N, and that's our GCD. Now, when we're working out our uh, actual math as I showed you when I was doodling there are a number of things we do so we have to work with the denominator so that's B times D and we have to work with the top alright and now we've got our two answers the numerator and the denominator they go to the GCD and it returns the divisor so when I've got this numerator here I'm gonna divide it by the divisor and I've got this denominator which I divide by the divisor and there you have how to write a function, and in this case, something that does fractional math using the GCD. All right, so there's the power of the GCD, and it has all kinds of applications and mathematical uh, problems. Hopefully you found that interesting. It's a new sort of angle that you don't see in a lot of different courses here on Udemy, and I thought it was kind of neat to show you, gives you a little bit of background information and some thought process that I find useful for students learning computer programming. Thanks for listening, and we're on now to the next section, Probabilistic Simulations.